All right, welcome to Real Analysis. Uh, that, that name just really pleases my heart. This is one of my favorite courses to teach. Upper level, uh, many of you seniors, some of you juniors. Uh, it is a proof-oriented course instead of an application-oriented course. Not that we won't mention applications from time to time, but for the most part, we're doing proofs. As you've experienced in algebraic structures, for those of you who weren't there, um, proofs can be pretty difficult and kind of abstract. But this, this class is a little bit more down to earth than algebraic structures, okay? Nothing quite so abstract as groups, rings, and fields. It's a little bit more down to earth that way. It's related to calculus. However, there is a, another side to that. The proofs are actually sometimes more difficult, okay? Um, algebra, you like to think of as being abstract, but somewhat straightforward. Oftentimes, at least, you know, you sort of, what's the only thing you can do in the next step of the proof? Try it, and it's usually the thing that you should be doing. Um, and uh, with real analysis, though, the next step is always is not always so clear. And you have to be a little bit, I have to be, as a grader of your, your work, I have to be a little extra picky about grading things, and the way you say things really, really makes a difference, and so, that's going to be the, the toughest part. I mean, you'll get partial credit, but it's going to be tough to get full credit on things because I have to be picky and that's part of my job. So it's not that I'm mad at you when I'm marking things that you should do differently in your proofs. I'm trying to help you to get better at it, and uh, that ends up being oftentimes the hardest part is doing those kinds of proofs. Um, we do have a Moodle page, as you've hopefully seen. And that's my view of it. You can see all the things I have hidden. Student view. Okay, what can you see so far? Our syllabus, uh, Mathematica version 10 installation instructions. Instructions, actually you can uh, load either version 10.4 or 11.0, I think it is. Either one is okay. The machines, Bethel's machines is gonna have version 10.4. Um, and Brian Turnquist used it last summer with his research uh, group and they have lots of there were no problems with it. I think version 10.2 was real buggy. It was for me at least. 10.4 I think is gonna be better. I'm probably gonna load 10.4 in my computer. Um, but I think it'll give you the options if you uh, can choose either 10.4 or 11.0 when you go through the installation instructions. All we did here, Zach said he was having difficulty loading, so hopefully we'll get those issues resolved. Eric Gossett's probably the best person to talk to about getting those issues resolved. Homework number zero was to do before today, and that was just to get your textbook and do some studying. The appendices are kind of long. See that there? The appendices are kind of long. It's 35 pages, it looks like, or so. 36 pages. Um, that's tough reading. It's not real easy going, okay? But I hope you did a little bit at least before today. Uh, to get you going on thinking about definitions and proofs. I will post the homework to work on for next time uh, as soon as I can after class is over here today. Any questions so far? Please, even though we're videotaping here for future classes, okay, feel free to ask questions. If you've got a question, probably somebody else in this class has a question and probably somebody else in the future class has a question. Maybe the same question, so feel free to ask. Nothing so far? Okay, so again, I'll put up the next assignment as soon as possible. As I do in multi and DiffyQ, uh, there will be completion and graded problems. Most of the problems you'll work on will be completion problems. And you'll be making a journal. Maybe you saw that in the syllabus. The journal is 10% of your grade. Where you are working on your completion problems and also doing some study guides. Solutions in the completion problem for the completion problems are in this section here as well as the study guides. Yes, the study guides, solution keys, yep. This preliminaries document is just some more background, kind of like the appendices. It's kind of abstract, um, but it's going to be something you're going to be working through. Study guides for the chapters. Um, maybe we should go ahead and take a look at one of those. Study guide for chapter one. Let's see, it's not me. 
Why don't you do a control plus to zoom? Uh, let's see. You. Let's try 200%. There we go. Okay, so this is the chapter one study guide, which is going to be part of your journal. And by the way, in your journal, you should either have two separate notebooks for the completion problems and the journal stuff, or one notebook and keep them separated. Keep the stuff you do for the uh, study guide separate from the completion problems. What do I have here? I've got first a summary of the things to get out of the chapter, the most important thing being something called the completeness axiom, other matters of importance, and then this thing that I call the reading guide. Anything that's got a star, like this right here, is something that is required to go into your journal. Um, and you just do your very best to answer as much as you can. It's for your benefit. I'm just checking to see that you gave it an attempt. You're trying to answer those kinds of questions. In this case, before you begin your reading. So anything that's got a star is required for, for, for full credit. There's another star. Anything that's a note is actually not something you need to put in your journal. Okay, it's just something to briefly read and note, and it's an interesting thing here. I used to teach at a class, uh, school called Florence University, actually just for one year. Bruce Porcio uh, is a math professor there. I was his sabbatical replacement way back about, uh, let's see, 19 years ago. And he wrote the article that's referred to near the beginning of chapter one here. And it was because I was his sabbatical replacement, perhaps, that he got that vertical done and, and some other stuff. It wasn't the only thing that he did. So anyway, that was kind of an interesting note. I couldn't resist putting that in there. Anything that doesn't have a star is optional to address in your journal. But you need to do at least nine of them. So there are 10 starred exercises. They're not really exercises. Well, well, some of them are exercises, but not all of them. Some of them are more questions to try to answer. There are 10 of those that are starred in chapter one, and do at least 25% of the other non-starred -non nine of those totals. So you'll have 19 things for chapter one that you put in your journal related to this study guide. And again, you're doing it for your benefit. This is kind of a long one. They're not all this long. You're doing it for your own benefit. You're trying to learn as much as possible. Okay? And I'm just giving you essentially completion credit for doing that. Any questions about that? I'm not going to check to see if it's right or not. Okay, you're doing your best to try to understand it for your own sake. I'm che checking to see that you gave good attempts for those things. Mm -hmm. So the journal is like our completion homework? Is that kind yeah, of? Essentially, okay. Yeah, essentially. Is that. Um, this is just part of it. Is that going to be uh, like going to be obvious to see you throughout the book when we should? Yeah, I mean, you should have your, this open as you read, okay. and you'll see as you go through that it's following the book. Okay. Yeah. Good questions. Mm -hmm. Is this something we're going to turn in every day? Yeah, not every day, but at, at exams, I'm going to have you turn them in. Okay. And I'll do a journal check at exams and give you that credit then. Good questions. I don't think of everything as I'm talking. So, yeah, if you've got a question, please ask me. Um, there again will be completion problems as well to put in a separate part of your journal. I don't have any up there yet, but I do have solutions. Solution keys, yeah, chapter one, solution key for completion problems. I've got all of them up here except for chapter seven and eight, uh, chapter eight actually. We're going to go through chapter eight. I don't quite have chapter eight up here yet. It will eventually be up there, but everything from chapters one through seven, the study guides and the solution keys, it's going to be up there. For the first two chapters, you're going to be doing all the completion problems, which is going to be a lot, because I think it's important to get a real good foundation. You're really doing a lot of the proofs related to real analysis. After chapter two, then you'll be doing about half of them. Okay, but I think it's important to get a good foundation to do them all for the first two chapters. And essentially our first exam, that's going to lead us up to the first exam. And the first exam is going to be essentially through chapter two, maybe a little bit of chapter three. And I got review materials for exams here, some, some old exams and solutions to a few of the problems. I might put some more solutions, I just haven't done that yet. All right, well let's get started talking about real analysis. 
So for future students, this is happens to be fall of 2016, and today's date is August 29th. I won't always put the date, but I think for this first class, I wanted to put it up there just to get it down for the record that you are in school here in 2016. What is this course about? Okay. In a nutshell, it's developing one variable calculus axiomatically and keeping at even more general related subjects, especially something called topology. Actually, when I took real analysis, I took it two places, here at Bethel and also at the University of Minnesota. And um, here at Bethel, we did it um, more slowly, axiomatically, and we did it in higher dimensional space dimensional space, three-dimensional space, n-dimensional space with vectors. And we only got through, as far as topics went, continuity, okay? Which, you know, if you think about calculus, continuity is like the first day of class, okay? So we were developing the theory, the definition of the theorem and the proofs up through continuity, but in higher dimensional space. Um, I do it differently. I teach it differently. This book, Real Analysis, by Russell Gordon, second edition. It's a very good book. Uh, it doesn't do things so generally, except chapter eight, actually. It approaches things more like calculus, one variable calculus, one dimensional space, essentially. The real number line is what you're studying and functions defined on that. And we get through more topics. We get through differentiation and integration and even into sequences and series, okay? Now, if you're gonna go to grad school, which a few of you might in math, that's probably not going to be a good enough foundation for grad school, and you might want to take what I did at the U of M, is I took another course in real analysis that sort of went more abstractly. Um, that was good. So if you're going to go to grad school, just realize that, that you probably need a class uh, to prep you for higher level classes in graduate school and other real analysis classes that really preps you better for that more abstractly. But most of you are not going to go to grad school, at least not in math. Most of you probably are going to either teach or work in the industry. And I think it's more beneficial, generally speaking, for you to have a class more oriented on focusing on calculus-related topics, one variable calculus. And that's what this book does, and it does a very good job of it. I think it's very, I think it's very readable, very understandable, and will help you gain intuition. In grad school, oftentimes the, the math book goes definition theorem proof, definition theorem proof, definition theorem proof with hardly any um, other kinds of comments. This book does give you other comments. It gives you insight into what's going on. We'll hint at more general to topics, um, and we'll get into some depth on topology in chapter eight, though not as much generality as we could. What does this mean for you? You'll be doing uh, a lot of reading and learning how to understand and construct mathematical proofs. You should strive to completely understand everything you read and to write, and, and as well to write very precisely and thoroughly when you do your own proofs, especially the ones that are great. Did you mention that you're going to try to put this up after class, or do you put your middle? Oh, yeah, I'll put this up after class. Yeah. After. Yep. So it's up to you whether you want to take notes. Uh, certainly, I think things that I write on the board you probably should take notes on. But as far as what I show you here, you don't have to. But you might want to take some notes just to remember what we did, if nothing else. We're also going to be striving to construct proofs that are elegant. Some of them have to be elegant to be full credit. Not necessarily. They have to be technically correct for full credit. But ideally, you shoot for proofs that are as short as possible, that still do what you need to do. Structured in a nice, logical way. I mean, it does have to be logical for full credit. It can't be a mess, logically speaking. You shoot for proofs that are short if you can. Okay? And I will somewhat in class also do that, although sometimes I'll put extra words just for extra clarity. Take advantage of these Mathematica notebooks that I have you and the links that are in here. These are all links, by the way. There's a Wikipedia page about mathematical beauty, which is what that word elegant is linked to. Um, that, you know, if the subject interests you, then go ahead and explore those if you have time, okay? There's priorities, of course, and maybe the subject doesn't interest you that much. But if it does, and if you've got some time, go ahead and click on those and spend a little time thinking about those. It'll enrich your experience in class, okay? 
make the class more meaningful and maybe even more understandable if you do. And uh, I thought it would be good to get a Bible verse in here um, that we want to study things because they are pure and good as well. I think math is pure and good. Finally, brother, was whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I do think that includes math, both pure math and applied math. Okay. Pure math, we can, I think, worship God is saying this is something very cool, that he's given us the mind to understand this, with enough work at least, and put things together solve problems. With applied math, it's good too, because you're still solving problems. You're trying to apply it to the real world. You're trying to do good with it. Um, so I, I think that's a very appropriate verse. Though. Any questions about overall big picture? We're still going to do overall big picture here, but with some details. Fundamental result of calculus, the mean value theorem, MVT, MVT. Go say it with me. MVT. MVT. Why? Because it's also the most valuable theorem, perhaps. For some people. Some people think of it that way. Uh, what was the mean value theorem? Did you cover in calculus? You remember hearing that phrase before? Mean value? Yeah. Some calculus classes don't even cover it. What a travesty. Oh. It is a beautiful theorem. Here's a statement right there. Is that big enough in the back? You need to zoom in a little more. We got to see the OK. Theorems have a structure to them, to their statement. There's an if and a then, typically. Not always, but typically. The part that comes after the if, the clause before the then, is called the hypothesis or hypotheses or premise. Word to use. In the proof of the theorem, when you prove a theorem, you need to assume the hypotheses hold. Okay, so you, if you, we were trying to prove the mean value theorem, and we will actually, you would start by assuming you got a function that's continuous on a closed interval from A to B. You got the square bracket notation comfortable with that. That's the interval of numbers between A and B, including the endpoints. It's Closed interval where it includes the endpoints. And it's differentiable on the open interval from A to B. So it mm, might not be differentiable at the endpoints. Weird. Essentially, we're trying to get away with sort of a, the fewest hypotheses we can. We're trying to make our hypotheses as weak as possible so that our, our theorem is as strong as possible. It applies to the most cases. The conclusion is the part that comes after the then, and the proof of the theorem, that's what you're trying to show follows from the hypothesis. There's a number C between A and B, strictly between A and B, where the derivative at C, F prime of C equals, what's this thing represent? F of B minus F of A over B minus A, you've seen that kind of thing before, right? It's TA for calculus. What they call those difference quotients usually is the name. What do they typically represent in calculus? Something like that. F of B minus F of A divided by B minus A. Or what does the derivative typically represent in calculus? Slope. slope, yeah. We're equating two slopes here. In fact, we can draw a generic graph. I'm not going to give this function a formula. I'm just drawing an arbitrary looking curve. Maybe A is right here, or maybe B is right there. That would make F of A right here, and F of B right about there. Future teachers, you call this thing that's highlighted the slope of the, what's it called? It starts with an S, the thing that's highlighted. Slope of a, uh, nobody remembered, not tangent line, but secant line. There we go, Kayla. You got it. Secant line. What's a secant line? Well, to a circle, it's a chord. But 
to a graph of a function between two points on the graph. It's just a line connecting them. That secant line, a secant line, one of infinitely many secant lines. Its slope equals f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a, rise over run, right? Delta y over delta x. How are we doing? Can you see that with the camera? Okay. The theorem says if you've got a nice continuous differentiable function like this, no breaks, smooth, there must be at least one point between a and b where the derivative, the slope of the tangent line, equals the slope of the secant line. There could be more than one C, and in fact, in this drawing, there is more than one. A tangent line right about there, right about there, and right about there. Those three tangent lines are drawn to have the same slope approximately. Pretend those are the same slope. So you might call this C1, this C2, and this C3. For those three C's, numbers between A and B, the slope of the tangent is the same as the slope of the secant. So it's a very reasonable sounding theorem then when you think about this kind of picture. And in fact, if you think of it in terms of physics, maybe it's even more reasonable sounding. Um, if f of t is your distance traveled as a function of time, pretend t is time, you're saying there's some time between the starting time a and the starting time b where your instantaneous speed equals your average speed. Right? If you tell a policeman, oh, I went from Minneapolis to St. Cloud in 15 minutes, they give you a ticket. <laughs> so it, it, you didn't catch me speeding. Well, there must have been some time where your average speed, well, you, you, there was some time where you sped as fast as your average speed. Actually, there's probably a time where you went faster than your average speed. And your average speed, if you went from Minneapolis to St. Cloud in 15 minutes, would have been higher than the speed. OK? How do you use a theorem? That's the statement of the theorem. Here's a visual interpretation of its meaning. How do you use a theorem? You have to have a situation where the, you know the hypotheses of the theorem are true in that situation. And then you can say the conclusion is true. For example, if I give you an you know, a simple function, a simple example like x cubed, and the interval from a to b is, say, the interval from 0 to 3. You're looking for a value of c where the derivative at c, which would be 3x squared, or 3c squared, equals the slope of the secant line here, f of 3 minus f of 0 divided by 3 minus 0 is. 27 over 3 is 9. Just solve for c. c squared is 3. c is plus or minus square root of 3. Should I throw away one of those? Yeah, I only want the one between a and b. So just use the plus square root of 3. By the way, make sure you check my algebra. Okay, I do make mistakes more often than I like. So. Make sure you catch any mistakes that I made. Does it look, look good there? <coughs> That's not a proof of the theorem, right? That's a particular example of an application. Well, it's not even applying the theorem, really, because we can solve for C. Really, the main point of the theorem is that C exists even if you can't solve for it. You know there's a number C that exists even if you can't solve for it. So I'm not really using the theorem here. I'm just illustrating it. I'm illustrating what the C happens to be in this case. I got some visual illustrations in the Mathematica notebook here. Here's for x squared. And you can change A and B if you like. So this is running slow. Oh, come on. Shouldn't be that slow. If it's going to be this slow, that's going to be bad news. This is the same problem 10.2 is having. I thought, I thought Karen Chris said 10.4 is better. Right, we didn't have problems in 10.4. Okay, I think it's 10.4 that's on here. Yeah. I don't know if that's possible. Oh, this was, 
happening in me all last year too. Manipulates have trouble. Now it works. <laughs> okay, so we see the secant line in blue and the tangent line in green. For a quadratic, the C is halfway between A and B is the midpoint. Not, not that way for a cubic. Which is more arbitrary than the function. It doesn't work perfectly, but that's a good enough. So the A is right here, the B is right over there, the C Yes, was the point, but that's not the exact spot. Theorems that are important, like mean value theorem, typically have a lot of corollaries. Things that are true because the mean value theorem is true in this case. And the proofs of the corollaries, ideally, are pretty easy to prove. They follow fairly quickly from the theorem. For example, an important theorem in calculus is something called the increasing function theorem right here. Yeah, I think it would be good to take notes on your statements to, tr to try to practice writing them down and remind yourself that there's an if and a then, hypotheses and a conclusion. It's abstract too, right? I'm not saying f is a particular function, I'm saying it's got a property, it's continuous on a closed interval and differentiable has a derivative on the open interval, right? You know, differential means it has a derivative. Derivative exists for all x in the open interval. If the derivative is always positive for all x in the open interval, then f is strictly increasing actually on the closed interval, amazingly enough. Of course, if there's an increasing function theorem, there must be a decreasing function. I'm not going to construct a careful proof of this, but let me write an equation on the board that would illustrate the main idea of proof. We'll, I'll write the equation and we'll think about what it would mean. A careful proof of this we might, you know, we'll do for sure in chapter four. The mean value theorem is what you need to prove this. Okay, it's a corollary of the mean value theorem. What you end up doing, first let me draw a picture, is you say, give me two arbitrary numbers between A and B. Call them x1 and x2, say. Now I've drawn x1 to be less than x2, but that wouldn't have to be the case. Although, log, what does that mean? Without loss of generality. Without loss of generality. Log is not a new kind of logarithm. Without loss of generality, you can assume x1 is less than x2. They're just symbols anyway. Doesn't matter. What are we trying to do if you look at the theorem conclusion? We're trying to prove f is strictly increasing. What does it mean to be strictly increasing? If you give me two arbitrary numbers in the interval, x1 and x2 with x1 less than x2, the function value's got to be higher at the, the bigger x, x2, than it is at x1. We want to prove f of x2 is bigger than f of x1. The key is to apply the mean value theorem to this function on not the entire interval from a to b, but the interval from x1 to x2. MBT would imply there exists. You've seen that before? I love math. <laughs> Backwards E means there exists. What does this mean? For all. For all. Yeah, universal quantifier, existential quantifier. There exists. Backwards E. For all. Upside down A. There exists a C between X1 and X2. It's an element of the interval from X1 to X2. <clears throat> 
such that I typically abbreviate ST. By the way, when you write proofs, you should use complete sentences. I'm not using complete sentences here. Though you certainly can abbreviate things, okay, to make it go faster. Standard abbreviations are fine. Don't use non-standard abbreviations, okay? ST means such that. This is, is that an E there? No, it's an epsilon, and here it actually means as C is an element of this. It's a, a member of the set. It's a number between x1 and x2. Such that what? F prime of C equals F of x2 minus F of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Using the x is not the A and the B. I'm applying the theorem on this smaller interval. Let me rewrite that equation by multiplying both sides by x2 minus x1. And x1 and x2 are different, so I'm not dividing by zero there. <clears throat> Let me write the equation this way. f of x2 minus f of x1 equals f prime of c times x2 minus x1. Okay, so again, this is not a, a proof, okay? If I were grading, if you wrote this as your proof of this increasing function theorem, you would not get full credit. I don't know, maybe three out of five or something. Actually, we're not done yet. We need to explain why we're almost done. You need to write complete sentences. I'm not doing that for sake of time. Okay. Let's think about it, though. What's the goal? The goal is to show f of x2 is bigger than f of x1. Hmm. What would that mean about this difference if that were true? Um, it would be positive. Can, can you see that by the way? Is it too long? This would be, po be positive. Hey, that's positive. What about that? It's assumed to be positive. I, I, yeah, I guess I have to use that. If you're going to prove a theorem, you've got to use the hypotheses somewhere. Otherwise, why would you be assuming them? And that's how you finish it off. You're assuming the derivative is positive for all x between a and b, which would include c. And with log, without loss of generality, x1 is less than x2, so this difference is positive. So the product of two positive numbers is positive. This is positive. Therefore, f of x2 is bigger than f of x1. Maybe it's good to add one more phrase here at the end, one more sentence, to say this proves f is strictly increasing because of the fact that x1 and x2 are arbitrary. If those are arbitrary numbers with x1 less than x2 in the interval, and f of x2 is bigger than f of x1, it's the arbitrariness that, that proves it. Because you could have, you know, you could have a graph that goes up and down, and f of x2 could be bigger than f of x1, but the function's not always increasing. Well, it's because if I pick different x1 and x2, it, that, that might not be positive for that graph. So it's the arbitrary, arbitrariness of the x1 and x2 that really leads you to the final conclusion. x1 and x2 are arbitrary numbers with x1 less than x2. Anyway, the mean value theorem is necessary to prove. Okay. Um, what should we do next? You do need to be careful how you interpret this theorem. This is a... Real analysis is, in, it is full of weird little examples that you would never expect if you're thinking about it too, too intuitively. I mean, intuition is good, but it can lead you astray. Somewhat counterintuitively, <clears throat> just because the derivative at some number c is positive, that doesn't mean f is increasing over some interval containing z. C. What? Is that what you learn in calculus? Derivative at c is positive, it must be increasing near c. No, that's actually not true. You might say it's mostly true, mm. probably true, with probability 0.999. No, no, don't go there. This is not a probability class. If it's true, if it's false for even one example, it's a false statement. Here's one example. This function. I'm going to write that in a piecewise formula by hand. <clears throat> f of x would be x over 2 plus x squared sine of 1 over x. If x is non-zero, 
and we define f of zero to be zero. That's what that mathematic proof it does. Creates this function. If x is non-zero, then the formula is this. Else, it's zero. The output. If you graph this function and zoom in, that's what it looks like from this window. If you zoom in near the origin, what happens? See lots of little tiny bumps there. But the graph does look straighter and straighter the closer you zoom in. And in fact, it looks like the derivative probably exists. And what is it? It's actually a half. And that's actually correct. The derivative at 0 actually is a half. It's positive. But this function is not increasing strictly on any interval containing 0, even though it looks like it is. What happens is these little bumps you can see here, where the function goes down at times, they actually continue forever and ever, and the bumps get closer and closer together. Infinitely many of them as you approach x equals 0 right here. So even though it looks like it's increasing, it's actually not on any interval containing 0. Pretty weird. And it's those kind of examples you want to realize are out there when you are thinking too intuitively about stuff and not carefully enough. These examples help stop you in your tracks and saying, oh, I think I better be more careful here. I'm going to move on to something else here in a few minutes, but let me just summarize a couple other things. There's something called the constant function theorem that follows from the mean, mean, mean value theorem. It sounds very intuitive that it's true, but it's proof required of the mean value theorem. If a, if a derivative is always 0, then the function is constant. That's not saying the same thing as if you've got a constant function, then its derivative is always 0. That's very easy to prove. If f is a constant function, its derivative is always 0. It's very easy to prove. This theorem is actually pretty hard to prove. You need the mean value theorem. And proving the mean value theorem is going to take us until chapter 4. Because of more foundational things we need to do. Other applications include the fact that antiderivatives of the same function differ by constants. On some interval, the first derivative test. The function has a derivative that's positive to the left of a critical point and negative to the right some interval near the critical point, then that critical point must be a local maximum. The fact that this function is something called the general solution of this differential equation, <coughs> we'll look at these applications later when we get to chapter 4. I also got stuff about the idea of the proof. I would highly suggest, I'm not going to go through this, but I would highly suggest when I get this up on Google that you download it and you work through this. It's sort of working backwards, sort of trying to construct the proof by working backwards or whatever more basic things that lead to the mean value theorem. Rolle's theorem is basically equivalent to the mean value theorem, and it's the mean value theorem in, in its simplest form. If f of a and f of b are equal, then there's some place where the derivative is zero because the secant line would have to slope to zero there. There's something called Fermat's theorem, not Fermat's last theorem, or his little theorem, but his theorem in real analysis. If c is a local extreme point, then f is either not differentiable at c or the derivative is 0. Something called the extreme value theorem. If you've got a continuous function on the closed interval, then there's a global maximum in, at least with the functions highest and the lowest. Definition of continuity, oh, no, I hardly even want to look at that. What? Blah, 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 blah. blah. OK, we're going to understand that blah, blah, blah stuff eventually. But that looks hard. Anybody ever seen that before? Uh, nobody? Oh, I teach it in my California class. A little bit at least. I've seen a little bit? OK. Ugh, why not? Definition of continuity. Definition of convergence of sequence. More blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Confusing looking stuff. We are going to understand that pretty soon here. You will understand it, OK? With enough effort. You all have the ability to, you know, you're all in here. 
You all have the ability to understand it. It's going to take effort, though, but you will get there. More definitions, more blah, blah, blah kind of looking stuff. What's this? Not Bolzano Weierstrass, Boltano Weierstrass. Okay. For some German names or German sounding names, I try to make sure I pronounce them correctly. W is a B sounding, for example. Uh, whereas for French names, it's kind of, well, okay, I do try to pronounce some French names correctly, but I don't think I'm as good at it. Bolzano Weierstrass is a theorem in chapter two that's pretty important. Chapter one, oh, you remember the reading guide? I said the most important thing to get out of that is something called the completeness axiom in chapter one. It's an axiom. What, what do you know about axioms? Do you know about axioms? They don't require proof. They don't require proof. Why not? Doesn't this seem like a theorem? For every non empty set of real numbers which is bounded above, there exists, if you're saying something, a real number which is a least upper bound of the, for that set. It is also a real number. Doesn't that sound like a theorem? Should we prove that? If you have a set that's bounded, go ahead. You have to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere, yeah. Now, actually, this could be a theorem. And we could call it the completeness theorem. And we could prove it for more basic principles. What would those more basic principles be? It would get down to things like, well, what is 1 plus 1? Basic arithmetic. We'd have to define addition, define multiplication. Oh, yeah. Define what a rational number is. Define what a what a real number is. If we did that, it would take us probably at least a month to get to the completeness axiom. Now it's interesting to a few people in the world. Actually, in grad school, for math majors in grad school, it should be interesting to at least half of them, I think. But maybe you guys, maybe it'd be interesting to five to ten percent of you. I don't know. We want to start at a higher level, so we're going to take this as an axiom. And we're going to take even more as axioms. We're going to talk about the real numbers as a complete ordered field. Algebraic structures field? Yeah. Although we're not going to spend a ton of time with the notion of a field. It's not going to be, the proofs are not going to be similar to algebraic structures for the most part. Except in that, that um, preliminaries handout that was on the Google. Or something like that. Not an empty set of real numbers and on the number line that's bounded above, it doesn't get above some number, has a least upper bound. A number that's higher than every number in the set, but is the smallest such number. Least upper bound. Sounds very reasonable. Shouldn't we be able to prove that pretty easily? It's pretty hard if you go back to foundations. We're going to take it as an axiom. We're going to assume it's true. Because again, you've got to start somewhere. I've got some more counterintuitive examples in this section that you can look over. I probably won't look at them today here. Maybe, maybe next time. What I do want to spend, um, hopefully, five to ten minutes on, because we are getting short on time right now is the proof that the square root of 2 is irrational. It's going to be a proof by contradiction. <sighs> Can I write it in sentences in five minutes? I think so. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and call it a theorem. I could state this theorem as the square root of 2 is irrational, not rational, but I'm going to state it in if-then form, so the premises and the conclusion are a little bit more clear. If x squared is 2, and implicitly assuming x is the number, or square root of 2, then what? x is not an element of the rationals. Q, fancy looking Q, stands for the rational numbers set of all rational numbers, Q for quotient. Rational numbers are quotient, they are ratios. X is not rational is what this means. We call such numbers irrational. 
and not the best terms, but we're stuck with them. The proof of this is one of the most beautiful proofs in the world, in the universe. You can say that. This is pretty profound. In fact, the story goes that somebody was sacrificed for this fact. You ever hear that story? The Pythagoreans thought all was rational in the world, but they also had the Pythagorean theorem. And if you draw a right triangle, these sides are one and one, <clears throat> 45, 45, 90 triangle by the Pythagorean theorem. This hypotenuse is going to have a length equal to root 2. They were very proud of the Pythagorean theorem. They knew the length of this was the square root of 2. They didn't know what the square root of 2 was, or what fraction it was. And it turned out somebody figured out it wasn't a fraction. It wasn't a ratio of integers. And the story is they got thrown overboard because of it. But eventually, nobody actually knows for sure if that's true. But it's kind of a fun story to say anyway. Eventually, um, they came to accept it and be pleased with it, and they felt sorry about sacrificing it, I think. <laughs> okay, it's a proof by contradiction. Assume the opposite of what you want to show. Assume to the contrary, I'm going to write fast here, to the contrary, that x is rational, so there exists a p and a q that are integers. Z stands for the set of integers, because Z stands for Zahlen, German word for number. Integers, the positive integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., 0, and also the negative integers, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, etc. Such that x is the ratio of p over q not equal to zero. We're about to do a log without a loss of generality. Maybe I should call it W log, but okay, I'll say log. That is actually the crux of the proof. It leads to the contradiction that we need, but it is definitely something you can assume without loss of generality. Without loss of generality, P, let me say it like this, either P or Q must be odd. They can't, well, okay, can be taken to be odd. That's probably not the best way to phrase this. Can be taken to be odd. Why? Because if they were both even, you could reduce the fraction. 16 over 12 is 8 6 is 4 thirds. Maybe I should have phrased it as at least one of P or Q can be taken to be odd. Or neither is even. Or, no, that's wrong. Well, okay, well, let's leave it like that. Either P or Q can be taken to be odd. The fractions reduce as much as possible, at least with regard to dividing by 2. All algebraic structures things. I could also do GCD of A and B is one. I don't need to do that. Or I meant P and Q, not A and B. I could have done that, which would imply that at least one of them's got to be odd. And that's just a matter of um, taking this equation and playing with it until you get a contradiction. And you will if you play with it enough. Why? Hmm. Then 2 is x squared is p squared over q squared. So p squared is 2q squared. I'm going to do a run-on sentence here. They can be OK. So p squared must be even. Interesting. Don't think the run-on sentence is too long. I think we'll start to bring it to a conclusion here. And therefore, P must be even. Wow, how about that? A profound thing. 
from this fact that x squared is 2. We discovered p must be even. Not odd. Weird. Does this take proof if p squared is even, p must be 2? Technically speaking, but it's very easy proof. Because if p were odd, its square would be odd. If p doesn't have any factor of 2, its square is not going to have any factor of 2 either. Right? You get that? p must be even 2 because if it were odd, p squared would be odd. Hmm. You can use three dots for therefore. I didn't hear, but I did there. Okay. Therefore, there exists, I don't know, let's call it an R, that's an integer, such that P is 2 times R. Because P is E. You see where we're going to go now? Now we're going to do a little more algebra substitution, replace P with 2R up here. Thus, 2R squared equals 2Q squared. So 4R squared equals 2Q squared. Is it bright enough if I go over here? So another round sentence. So Q squared equals 2R squared. And Q squared must be even. But this means Q is even. Basically, we're done. That's our contradiction. Math teachers, when they run into a contradiction, often put a symbol. Looks like this. My math teacher never told me what that was. I thought it was a star. And in fact, I would typically see it more like this. It's actually two arrows pointing at each other. Contradiction. So I'll try to make it more like two arrows pointing at each other. Contradiction. What does it contradict? It contradicts the fact that either P or Q must must be taken to be out, or can be taken to be out, and I am taking it to be out. I think the can is the problem there. Can be taken to be out, and I am taking one of them to be out. I've reduced the fraction enough to at least cancel the twos. And that's not a problem. You definitely can do that. You definitely can always reduce fractions. And so we got a contradiction to that. So what do you say there? Uh, you, you say to finish this off, I'm not going to write it but you might, might want to write what I'm about to say. We have obtained a contradiction. Therefore, our original assumption to the contrary must be false. Therefore, x is not a rational number. I'll say that again. This contradiction means our original assumption to the contrary must be false. And therefore, x must not be rational. It must be what we call irrational. The structure of the argument is like this. You might remember that from discrete math. I think I'm not going to take the time to look at that. Let me just take one minute to think about this question, and then we will be done. It's a harder question. How do you know square root of 2 exists? In this theorem, and it's proof I was literally assuming there was a number x whose square root of 2. I didn't prove there was such a number. In fact, since it's not rational, no fraction is going to, you're going to be able to square to get two. No ratio of integers. Well, you might say, well, what about the decimal expansion? Mathematica knows about square root of two, right? And uh, the square root of two, right? But that's not square root of two. That's just an approximation for it. OK, what about um, 10,000 decimal places? OK. There we are, 10,000 decimal place approximation to the square root of two. But it doesn't equal the square root of 2. You square that number, you're not going to get exactly 2. You're just going to be really, 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 really close. I 
know if Mathematica approxim um, rounds it or not here. Okay, it's making you think it's exactly two, but it's not. It's not. Okay. Maybe I need more decimal places. It's not exactly square. It's not exactly two when you square that number. In fact, the decimal expansion goes on forever without a repeating pattern, and nobody knows but God all decimal places for square root two. So if you don't know all the decimals, how can you square it and get two? How do you know there is such a number? How do you even square such a number? How would you do that? Decimal expansion is not good enough for the definition of a real number. And it is an issue to prove square root of 2 exists in the first place. And we will do it with a complete text. All right. That's it for today. See you next day.